Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 98, recorded April 10th, 2013. Brewster Kale. Triangulation is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. And to kick off the new release of Dimension of Miracles, Audible is sending a lucky winner to Comic-Con. Enter at audible.com slash sweeps. It's time for Triangulation, the show that uh, we do every week where we get the most interesting people uh, on, on and, and we talk to him about the most interesting things. And this this guest I'm so excited about. Um, I'm, I'm always excited because we always have great guests on. But let me just give, with, before I give you his name, although those of you watching a video know his name already, but before I give you his name, let me tell you that our guest is a member of the Internet Hall of Fame, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, is on the board of the Electronic Frontier Foundation of Public Knowledge, uh, Internet Memory, uh, and the Television Archive. He is a member of the National Science Foundation's Advisory Committee for Cyber Infrastructure. He is perhaps the most important engineer on the Internet that you may never have heard of. His name <laughs> is Brewster Kale. Brewster, it's so great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. You're a uh, uh, fascinating uh, fellow, and you said something interesting. People have probably know about the Internet Archive. I think that that is... That is kind of the, the flagship project that you do, but you do a lot of other uh, things. But you said something interesting, that there is kind of a thread throughout everything uh, that you do. What is that? The idea is to build universal access to all knowledge. It was an idea by Raj Reddy of Carnegie Mellon. And the idea that we could one-up the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks uh, and the Egyptians built the Library of Alexandria in 300 BC. The idea was to, well, have everything. You know, that kind of old Greek... <laughs> uh, kind of idea and the industriousness of the Egyptians, they, by some scholars' perspectives, they got 75% of all of the books ever published at that time. And great things came of it, amazing things. Uh, they knew that the earth was round. They not only knew the earth was round, they knew how big it was within 1%. Uh, anyway, it was just fantastic. Um, so the, the history of building a library is, is a good one. But the idea of one-upping them is to try to make it so that all the published works of humankind could be accessible to anybody anywhere in the world. Could you actually pull that off? And the answer technically is, yeah, sure, of course. You know, computers at this point can go and do all of the books, music, video, software, web pages, basically, well, everything sort of meant to be published um, could be recorded and then made available over the internet. Then the question is, can you actually pull this off? Can you go and have libraries participate? Can you um, have the industries sort of shift around such that they're not based on analog distribution but digital distribution and not basically sue everybody into creators? Um, they try to come anywhere near their, uh, their piece of turf. And that's been a slow go. Oh, you know, we're now in 2013. You sort of... I think kids at this point think everything's already online, certainly anything that they're going to really use for educating themselves. And the answer is it's not really true. It's not online. Um, so the Internet Archive does what it can to try to have that vision of the Internet, that one of sort of the, the great library, um, come true. So that's, that's the project that I spend my time doing. And coming full circle... The library at Alexandria now is one of the hosts for the Internet Archive. Yes. I love that. Oh, oh, it's completely great. So they were building a new version of the new of the Library of Alexandria. The first one burned Alexandria. down a it, little while ago. Yeah, it, it, it kind of burned in a sequence of phases. It sort of puttered out as people shifted away from the idea of access to information as a good thing. And uh, the sort of the Greek ideals uh, kind of made way for other ideals that went through the Middle Ages. 
And of course, we then saw a rebirth in the renaissance of the Greek ideals of, of universal education, of knowledge and science, and all of those sorts of things. It sort of came back around and back in fashion, um, but we lost the Library of Alexandria. I, I, and I had the pleasure of going to Alexandria and spending a couple of months to help rebuild the Library of Alexandria. It's, it's beautiful, uh, by the way. The new one is so... Building. And it's so not that gorgeous. far from Cairo, so anybody that uh, has the opportunity to uh, to go and visit, it is spectacular. But they knew that they weren't going to be able to make it in in books. You know, they're, they're sort of too late to the party. So they said, could we go and have all digital materials and everything in digital form? And it actually has some precedent. The uh, Library of Alexandria version one had papyrus, which was a fabulous technology of comparing it against clay tablets. Um, and so the idea, uh, so we donated a copy of the World Wide Web in 2002. <laughs> and also... Uh, Wait a minute. Uh, all the Prelinger <laughs> websites. Okay, so you've, you've been... I mean, there's so many questions. Since 1996, you have been archiving the World Wide Web. Yes. How much data is that? Uh, just the web collection is uh, currently uh, about five petabytes of compressed Jesus. data. So it's uh, it goes mega, giga, tera, and then after that is peta. peta. Um, so if you take the compressed data, it's about five petabytes. So that's about ten petabytes of uncompressed uh, uh, data. It's oh every week the Wayback Machine, which is the access way that you can go and type in a URL right. and see past versions of the website uh, of all of the website you're looking for and click around and surf the web as it was. We refresh that index. We basically go back through all of our pages and create a new index so that it's it's up to date. Um, it's usually about two weeks lag. Um, and it just crossed over 283 billion pages. So it's getting big. Do you have everything? We try. Uh, but the answer is no, we don't have everything. Um, uh, it, you, you'll, you'll see if you go and take a, a site that's pretty deep, you know, we'll have patches uh, right. and, and not all of it. So what we've done is, is um, work with librarians. So we have a broad web crawl that every two months tries to take a snapshot. It, takes a, it goes to every website and tries to get every web page and all the images on it from every website. It's kind of mind-boggling. I mean, the web has grown uh, uh, exponentially. Yes, we collect about a billion pages a week now. Wow. Um, so it's it's <laughs> it's huge, um, but it's it's still even larger than that. And, and a lot of pages are automatically generated, so you kind of get stuck in these these little cul-de-sacs of of yeah. Amazon.com is this, is different every time you refresh it, so you you yes. have to take a snapshot in time. You have you to can't. take snapshots, and they're even you know sites that play chess with you and those are effectively infinite so uh we have um we work with about 12 national libraries and we work with about 240 university libraries and state libraries and they have librarians that direct the crawling and say if you want to get this subject area you need to get these sites at this frequency and we try to make sure that those are done really well so we have this broad crawl which does as best it can, um, but it's kind of a dumb robot. Then there are people-assisted uh, crawls to really make sure we've got good stuff. So, for instance, when the um, uh, Japanese tsunami happened, uh, within a couple of hours of that happening, all sorts of people jumped up and started archiving away. And these are, you know, we coordinated people from Japan, from Harvard, from all over the world that knew of sites that were going to be important to understand this major phenomenon that was going on. And uh, so we started crawling this and, and making a, a searchable index uh, for it and then presented it back to the National Diet Library, which is the Library of Congress in Japan. Harvard has taken further to go and try to make that collection usable in a classroom. So how do you go and bring these things sort of full circle to make references out of it is is, is, a, is a challenge, but this is what we're trying to do because the web is a document, is the document of our times. And, and it's um, uh, average life of a web page is about 100 days before it's either changed or it disappears. So if you don't actively crawl this stuff, it, it just, it, it's gone. Somebody we, said, somebody has said history actually begins in 1996 because <laughs> this is a very different kind of history. Every the original materials are now saved. 
Yeah. And, and in, in obsessive detail about everything. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, we don't save everything, everything. There are things, parts of it that people don't want to have saved. And we respect it. They do it with robot exclusions or they contact us. Usually it's so for you, privacy So you honor robots.txt. So if somebody uses a robots.txt, you won't yeah, scan it. Yeah, it's not in the Wayback Machine. And, yeah. uh, and even if they go and put it up now, we retroactively respect it. Wow. Um, That's nice of you. Well, but what yeah, about copyrights? I mean, you are, copy, you are saving copy, a ton of copyright material. What about that? Libraries are you know, full of copyrighted materials. That's what libraries are. They're, we we basically have you know bookshelves full of copyrighted materials, and we make them available to people in ways that are gener generally beneficial all the way around. So I think of the what the Internet Archive is doing is 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 just building a library, just kind of the same old way, but it's just now in digital form. So you don't get and complaints from people that. Well, they do want to be taken out of the Wayback Machine, and we have movies and music, and um, but you know, we're not going and posting Harry Potter right um, for a free download to everybody. I mean, it's it's limited in the sorts of ways that you'd kind of imagine a library. And since people still remember what libraries were in the physical world, we get explained to people, right. you know, Makes put sense. things in here that oh, should be it. in a library. Yeah. You know, deal with us as a library. Don't, you know... Don't be a dork. You can actually upload stuff to archive.org. In fact, in the earliest days of my podcast, that's how we distributed them. Uh, yes. Because you offer free bandwidth for people. Yep. We, uh, we get thousands of uploads a day. Um, there's a little button on archive.org. And uh, you can go and add things into the collection. We uh, keep the formats up so if people go and upload whatever weird video technology is currently the one of the day, then we keep it moving uh, to the new video versions as as new technologies roll around uh, same with audio um books we now have about four four million texts uh on on the archive which is enormous um the it would probably be about between two and three million what you'd really call books and a yale a princeton or a boston public library is about 10 million books so if we strove for that quantity if we can get it sort of to all work, um, both in copyright and out of copyright materials, then that is a, uh, that would be a library that we could you know, think is a victory, that we could have people learn enough uh, to be uh, college educated and uh, be able to participate in, in society. But we're not, we're not there yet. So we have about two to three million that are public domain books. And if you go to openlibrary.org, which is a really great site, um, it's a run by the Internet Archive as well. It's really focusing on books, and it is a um, a website that you can go and read public domain books, but you can also borrow um, recent books, books yeah, that are from the twentieth century. Public domain you, starts in like or ends in like 1924, 1923. But you see that second uh, tier there. These are that, that row. Yeah. There it is. You click on those, uh, and uh, what is that? A romance there. Yeah. It's like an Here's an Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock. Yeah, wow. so you can go and click on that, and if nobody's checked it out, yeah, over there on the right-hand side, you can click uh, borrow ebook. So that's how. That, so there's a limited number of people can borrow it, just like a, a real one library. at a time, like a real library. So it's one person at a time. So we've we have that physical book, or we bought that ebook from a publisher. Well, either way, so we try to buy the book ebooks because they're. You know, they look better online. But if we don't, if we can't get it that way, then we scan the book and we lend it one person at a time. That is we so use cool. Now, you've that, been uh, critical of Google's plan to scan all the books. into. In, yes. Why? Aren't they doing the same thing? Um, I, I applaud the idea of trying to get the library online. The question is, is, is it going to be, you know, controlled by one or two entities? And the way that they did it is they um, worked with... Um, libraries to go and digitize the public domain and Google got a copy and then they contractually put in, a, a, they gave a copy back to the libraries, but they couldn't redistribute them. Right. So they effectively locked up the public domain, which in my world, if there's a sin out there, that's it. That's one of them. Yeah. And then there was the problem of the works of the 20th century, kind of the orphan works, the things that aren't being currently sold. Um, and they had this, really wild scheme 
uh, to go and build a nonprofit entity called the Books Rights Registry, which is sort of a little odd name for it. But it, it was a, an organization that would own and control and price and sell access to the out-of-print orphan works. And then create a pool to reimburse the right. copyright but, holders but they if they should show up. they basically making a price and control on something that really should be open kind of out there yeah. open i mean yeah. these are things that are old they're not they they, they are you shouldn't go and, and hold those books hostage um they should be let free and so that was something that the judge said yeah you can't do that <laughs> you can't go and rewrite all the copyright law in a class action <laughs> settlement um and I so try. We, we, and so the the idea now is we do want the Library of Alexandria. So how do we get there? Right. So now there are a thousand libraries that are actually digitizing books under their own names that are not rights cleared and making them available for borrowing. As a library. Because, because that's what libraries we're libraries. Do. That's what we do. I love that. So, it's a, it feels like a loophole, but it's not. Because it really is in the public interest. That's why this has always existed. Yes. And, and people use libraries differently than they use bookstores. It's for going and getting you know, access to old Research. newspapers yeah. to go and try to understand what was yeah. the 1750s like. Um, or what, you know, try to understand different, different ways. It, it, and so their libraries often do not compete as much as you'd imagine with the book publishing industry in total. And in fact, the libraries spend about three or four billion dollars a year on publishers' products. So they're often sort of the mainstay, they're the best buyers for certain types of works that the publishers want. So we want to have this continue. We want to have lots of publishers that make money, lots of authors, many of which make money. You know, some of them are academic authors and they're not motivated in that way, but some are trying to support themselves at it. Uh, we want lots of libraries. We want no central points of control. We want a, a, a decentralized um, world that has incentives to go and create new works, but access for everyone. And we have the money to do it. We just have to organize ourselves to do it. And it actually was, if we had just not screwed around with the laws quite so much um, from <laughs> the physical it. age, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think we'd be a lot closer. Well, you're um, getting but it. right now, it's we're kind of wrestling around with the, the whole thing and People are getting kind of confused. You said you have the money. Where does this money come from? Well, the library system, is, well, I don't have this much money, but the library system spends about $12 billion a year um, on itself in the United States, $31 billion worldwide. And a quarter to a third of that goes to publishers' products. Um, the other two-thirds goes to buildings and the people and the long-term maintenance of the materials and that kind of thing. And it's mostly taxpayer money and also goes uh, from universities. Because it's just recognized this is good for everything, for everybody, for historians, for researchers, for innovation, for human beings. This is, the, this is our culture. It's exactly. And what's interesting and new now with this generation is we can mix machines into it. So it's not just getting access to books and reading them in the same way we used to. We can now have machines go and right. you know, find patterns and do interesting, weird things with them or pull it all apart and, and, and do fun things. And um, so these new studies of going and doing digital humanities to understand what was going on in the slave states by going and analyzing the text in lots and lots of newspapers is something that people couldn't do, but people with combination with computers can do. Uh, we use Google or Bing or Yahoo every day, and that's just sort of computer augmented smarts of people all being woven together. So we're starting to build that global brain, but it's not this threatening other that I think that the AI guys, and I was right. one of them, um, really thought. It, it's this symbiosis between people and computers and networks that are building something that is of impressive scale. And you, it's very helpful to be able to, to look at these materials as data. Um, so going and surveying literature is now possible. Aaron Schwartz, though, was going and downloading a large amount of of journal literature from a nonprofit library, and the nonprofit library jumped up and down 
called JSTOR to mm -hmm. get uh, to to cause them to stop, mm -hmm. and they ended up calling the cops, and it would it ended up being a federal um, criminal trial for going and reading papers in the library just too fast. I mean, so I, I there, we haven't smoothed this out. That, that I mean that that was a whole that was a disaster. I don't mean to make light light no, of it. No, it was a, it ended absolutely up very badly. Aaron yeah. Schwartz ended up committing suicide. So we don't have everybody kind of along uh, with the same message It's yet. not without peril. It's clear. Um, it, we're in transition. Yeah. And, and there, there are people that are kind of hanging on to the old and uh, trying to figure out how to adjust their business models that work much better uh, with open access. But then where does the money come from? And all of these uh, are, are, are rippling through different fields. Um, so the Internet Archive plays a role in these by trying to help move things along, see if we can get publishers paid for their new works, but let's go and digitize the old works and make them available. So it, can we kind of, can we move forward so that we're just not ending up with random lawsuits that don't seem to go anywhere and cost a lot of money and end up sometimes with disastrous results? However you're doing it, you're doing it right because I keep expecting people to get up in arms about the uh, Internet Archive and nobody is. So you're gently, it's very gentle. You're gently moving this forward in a way that's quite successful. And I look at what's on the Internet Archive. I mean, not only that whole petabytes worth of the web, but 1.1 million movies. You've got 114,000 concerts. One point. Oh, go for the TV. Oh, let's talk about let's the TV. To, okay, the so this is a great example. If you go to archive.org slash TV... This is 424,000 broadcast news reports, and you can search because you've got done closed captioning on it, or you can yes, search for information. Closed captions. It, we're trying to make everyone into a John Stewart research department. You know how, how he, he pulls these parts of news and says that, well, this is what this politician said before, and now he's saying this different, you know, that shtick. Um, can we make it so that people can research television news the way that you have always been able to, to do research on, on newspapers? Can you quote, can you compare, and contrast? And so we've been recording television news now for many years, and uh, we've now made it so that it's indexed. So you can search it and find 30-second clips uh, for free, archive.org slash TV. It's, it's fun to try. Um, sometimes you'll find that, you know, there really isn't that much on TV um, about <laughs> subjects. Uh, and sometimes they get really obsessive about sort of all the wrong things. A anyway, but you can tell and you can, uh, there's an advanced search uh, button. If you t take a look under the, uh, More search underneath options the search here. box there, yeah. and it'll tell you how many hits that query had on each program That's and amazing. each station. Now, and how far year. back does this go? It doesn't go that far back yet. No, it doesn't. It only um, what we have online is mid two thousand and nine up until one day ago. Okay. So that is the idea. Is uh, that's as much as we could afford. So we're we're trying to go backwards as, as we can, but we wanted to get something out before the last election. Uh, mm. We have this you know dream that if they can actually people can research their candidates and find out really what the debates are on different channels than maybe the one that you always watch, that people will vote better. Uh, maybe a little bit dreaming, but at least this is what we're supposed to be as libraries. So we put this out before the last election and uh, made it uh, available, and people are, are using it for making documentaries. Because uh, if you click on one of those, you're only going to get 30 seconds there. Um, but you can... Click on one and then get to the whole no program. Safety oh, net. I guess you know, um, Bush ran for have to go to the more borrow button on the top yeah. of that little thing, and then you'll see it in higher res. Um, but you, but so it's very easy to get a clip to program. see a higher res clip, and then you can even borrow a DVD. That's you can borrow a DVD of the program. You have to give it back after 30 days, sure, but then that gives um, documentarians what it is they need to try to figure out: is this the the part that they want to license, or however they're going to try to to get the um, uh, the rights to go and reuse the materials. But this is the idea is to just do for what we've always done with newspapers in the television space. But it's enormous scale. It's 400,000 programs. Uh, they come in at hundreds of hours a day. Um, and we... Is CNN I, giving you these? I mean, how do you get them? Uh, we get them off air. You, you record um, them? It, yeah, we record them. <laughs> At scale. The infrastructure it, is mind-boggling of what you're doing. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it's 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 fun to operate at this scale. I used to design design supercomputers. And this is this takes <laughs> takes everything we know. Um, but this this project is built on the um, on Vanderbilt University started uh, archiving television news before the 1968 Democratic National Convention, which sort of went bonkers. Um, they there was a right wing guy in um, Tex in, in Tennessee that thought that there was a left leftward shift to right. uh, to the news. Sound familiar? And so he was appalled that you couldn't actually get to pass the copy. So he, he um, went and gave some money to Vanderbilt Tent University and they started recording um, this materials. And it um, they were sued um, in the early 1970s and the the uh, way it was resolved was they waited to go and put in an exemption in the uh, in the 1976 Copyright Act. Um, so, you know, based on that and, and sort of generally life, you know, sort of moving along, um, we're sort of following in the footsteps of those great librarians in Tennessee towards making it so that you can actually do research about a very pervasive and a very, very persuasive um, uh subject I, I but i on the other hand i i, I typed in bitcoin because uh, we we've been all psyched about bitcoin uh lately. you accept and, bitcoin uh, donations by the way yeah we take we yeah. accept bitcoin and people were very generous at the end of last year and the year before um, and it's so we, going we up a lot of coins and they're worth a bunch more yeah uh, they were and we we started um paying our um giving some of our employees options to go and and get paid partially in bitcoins and we got the sushi place next door they're accepting bitcoins anyway so we're having a great <laughs> that's fun awesome time. and uh, so I, I searched on bitcoin on uh on tv news and it really hasn't made it to tv news it's it's all over the financial press and of course it's all over the blogs um but it really hasn't cracked through but if you take things that are celebrities or some of the political issues of the day or anything that has really graphic um, content than television is really emphasized. There's a study at, at Harvard about the Trayvon Martin case hmm. and sort of how did that wave come through both the print press and the television press and how did it so now with our, our collection you can start to do these kinds of analyses of what kind of bias are there? Is there is it slanted? Right. Is it right. following the print press? Is it leading the print press? You can actually do this kind of analysis in the first time ever. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit. So is it totally run on contributions? How does it work? Uh, the Internet Archive is funded by libraries paying us to digitize books and okay. collect web pages. And okay. um, that covers about half of our in, uh, of our income. And the rest comes from almost all from foundations uh, and individual contributions. Um, and <laughs> if our Bitcoins uh, go up more in value, then... <laughs> It'll be more bitcoins, <laughs> but it's um, we're here by the the uh, kindness of strangers and kindness of the internet community. So it's um, we we hold out our hand every every December to try to um, to to get as much as we you know contributions as we can. And actually, it's it's doing better year by year. It's still Good. a small percentage, but people are starting to understand that, yeah, you're going to have to really support these websites. There are people actually behind them. Um, and so that's, uh, so we do welcome contributions and projects with people. Um, people donate a lot of their time to building the collections. One of my favorites is the live music guys. It's um, incredible. I mean, they, <laughs> just the Grateful Dead concerts alone. All of them. All of them. We have all, we have all of them. Um, and, but they're now I don't know, over 5,000 bands that have said, yes, we'd like to be archived. And then the fans go and do the recordings often. Sometimes it's somebody associated with the band will get get it off the soundboard and then they'll upload it to the Internet Archive. We're getting, I don't know, two or three bands a day saying they want to join in and about 40 or 50 concerts a day are being uploaded. And the key thing here is no one's making any money. There's no ads, there's no subscription, and this is um, a tradition that the Grateful Dead started, that if no one makes any money, you can go and share their music after they've played it. And it's, um, it's working. It's working. It works all the way around. I think about the Smithsonian and the, the collection of uh, blues and folk that was uh, made... Folk Folkways, what a fat! What a fabulous collection! Yes, yeah. all the field recordings from the uh, uh, the American South. Um, but this is yes. that times a million. 
<laughs> yes. Because you're, so, I mean, that is such a huge and valuable collection at the Smithsonian, and it's just a fraction of the stuff that you're collecting. Uh, we collect other kinds of things. So the, um, uh, we, there was this wonderful site called Ayuma, Inter Internet Underground Music, Music Archive. Archive. Wonderful. In the early yeah. 1990s. It yeah. was really trying to figure out that, you know, MP3 hadn't been developed yet and people wanted to go and make their music available. And it was for free. And uh, so they had this wonderful site. They operated out of Santa Cruz. And, oh, it lasted several years and then it was bought or munched or something. Um, but... E-Music uh, bought it, but it, 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 it stopped a very, being a non-profit, basically. It... It didn't work. Yeah. And it, so it, it faded away and died. So, um, but a friend had gone and archived a really good copy and he said, I've got it. Oh. And uh, so. Um, so you have Iuma's or archives? Iuma's on there. The whole darn thing. And it was uh, really organized and orchestrated by archive team which is Jason Scott, who's this rogue archivist who's completely great. Uh, and his little band of, of, um, of volunteer archivists go and archive things and put them into the Internet Archive. Um, and so Iuma is now up. We have mp3.com's collection, um, the live music collection. Um, it, it, it's, it's getting large. Uh, but now, actually, most of it's on YouTube. And YouTube is a real quandary of how do you go and, and archive mm -hmm. that enough. We're only collecting about one terabyte of, of, of uh, YouTube a day. Um, and the way that we select what we what we do is if it was mentioned in Twitter, then we archive it. Oh, that's clever. Uh, that's and a that good idea. It's just a way because there's an awful lot uh, to it. We we wouldn't be able to afford to keep up. Right. But it harnesses a little bit of kind of automated to to stop it. Automated curation to to select something that people thought was valuable enough to note it. That's that's the idea. Yeah. Make it so that if you saw it before, you can see it again. Um, it's we're kind of the out of print web page service. So uh, where does where does the Internet Archive live? Um, uh, our headquarters is in San Francisco. We bought a church. Um, it's completely great. It's an old Christian Science church, and the servers for this are actually in the church. Uh, and we don't have any air conditioning. We actually use the heat that they generate to heat the building. <laughs> so it's, we, we call it frugal, but we're also green. Um, so we figured out how to do that. And then we have another copy in Richmond, California and, and, and Redwood City, and then a partial copy in Alexandria, Egypt, and a partial copy in Amsterdam. So uh, the, what happens to the libraries is they're burned. Right. Uh, Library of Congress is already burned once. It was right. burned by the British. Oh, and in general, they're burned by governments. So it, it's usually not... Uh, Caesar, Caesar <laughs> burnt, uh, burnt the original library of Alexandria, at least legend says. Legend said, yes, he, he was um, kind of hiding out from the, uh, the Romans. Uh, you'd think, why was he hiding it? Well, he, he was out of favor. So he, <laughs> he went and uh, uh, shacked up with, with Cleopatra. And, burned his ships. And there was, a, right, the, the, uh, the harbor burned. And, and supposedly a bunch of the books burned. But um, it, there was a whole sequence. And, and basically the Library of Alexandria dissolved. It wasn't just one right. sort of conflagration. Yeah. Uh, it fell apart. There's a wonderful movie called Agora which is about the last days of the Library of Alexandria oh, in about 400 AD and uh, with Hypatia. It's, it's a fabulous, oh, it. fabulous movie. It's, uh, but one uh, thing's different about those old school libraries. They could burn because they were mostly paper. Yeah, those were papyrus. Um, but, but yes. Um, You're not going to burn. Oh, uh, right. So we have our, let's see, we're on a... You might heat up. This goes on an earthquake zone, yeah. and uh, then there's Middle East and uh, flood zone for uh, Alex, uh, for Amsterdam. Well, what could go wrong? <laughs> uh, but so it, I, it's unlikely it'll all go wrong at once. Oh, the idea is to really to diversify. Yeah. And to, yeah. to make it so that if the Library of Alexandria had made another copy and put it in India or China... It'd be a good thing. Then we'd have the other works of Aristotle, the other plays of Euripides. Amazing. We don't. We don't. Um, so if we can go and put copies other places and start to have large-scale swap agreements, so as revolutions come through or iron curtains go up and down, um, we we work to try to restore each other's collections. Right. But that's um, the beauty of the bits. They're infinitely copyable at speed of light. Perfect copies are possible. So bits yes. make it a lot easier. Bits make it a lot easier. And 10 petabytes, you say, well, that's a 
large amount of information, and it is, um, but it's only I don't know, millions of dollars. Right. It's not tens of millions. It's not hundreds of millions. It's thousands it's of hard of drives. It's thousands computer. of hard drives. And you can it's imagine a space with thousands of hard drives. It's not unimaginable. It's not unimaginable. It would fit in the room you're in right now. Right. It would fit in a room that almost any of us are in. Right. Okay, it would get hot. But it's not <laughs> that big. Right. Uh, a petabyte um, it is, is one rack at this point. So wow. 10 petabytes is 10 racks if you don't have copies. So all this stuff is on hard drives. Yes. And the servers are kind of traditional. Uh, uh, we very carefully kind of hand make them, and they've got these nice blinky lights on them. So good, good. as people <laughs> upload and download to them, they, they, they glow. It's sort of a, a glowing Ooh. book. Oh, it's, it's gorgeous. Yeah, um, so We're going to come down with a camera. Can, do you let camera crews come, come in? I'd love to bring oh, a camera yeah. crew in. Absolutely. Come on in. It, 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 it's great. Um, it, it's beautiful. We've used the, the church, I think, um, well. We are yeah. people of the books, yeah. if you notice the plural. Yeah. Um, and it's, it works. Um, so, it, so the servers are there. We have the programmers and uh, administrators and librarians there, mostly. And then we have scanning centers in 30 libraries in eight countries. So we digitize about 1,000 books a day. We have a room inside the Library of Congress itself. And we're just digitizing books all day long, every day, wow. to make them publicly available for free. That is so great. Yeah, so it's it's fun. I think people kind of get that this is the future. Uh, the kids, as if it's not online, it's as if it doesn't exist. And our role as librarians or parents is to put the best we have to offer within reach of our children. And what the best we have to offer is not online yet. It, it's not online. So if we don't do it, they're going to learn from whatever they can get a hold of. Mm. Which, you know, Wikipedia is good, but it's really pretty thin. If there's something you know a lot about, you'll find that it's just not online. Or at least there aren't different points of view. It, we're missing the 20th century. We may have a pretty good shot at the 21st century, but that 20th century is just really not very available. Isn't, isn't that ironic? Because that was, of course, the century that information technology arose in. Yes. And we don't, yes, that's and the one we don't, because of, and it's because of these copyright laws, I presume. It's institutions that kind of are doing the my, mine, mine thing. Right. And it's not always copyright. It's sometimes, well, yeah, they're proud of it or they're right. libraries that don't want to share or, I, but yes, it's time to get on with it um, and, and sort of envision this better future and then find our role in this sort of uh, environment where, Yes, there are people that are paid to, to create things, but we've got a lot more access and a lot more ability to reuse and remix and rethink and Yay. compare and contrast, make multimedia essays this time around. Um, we're digitizing a lot of home movies now, um, <laughs> which is really fun, 8 and 16 millimeter films. But that's, um, the, that's the real life. It's the, the life of the people. Yes. And that's, what you, you know, that's the stuff that doesn't get recorded in history. Those those are often just forgotten, and it is a, it's an un, um, recast or recontextualized or sort of packaged view of the world. If I I think of this generation as a very visual generation, and they want to see it, and well, if you look back in the sort of mid twentieth century, you're going to see a lot of Hollywood movies, and that's sort of how Hollywood was painting it. So uh, one of our board members, Rick Prelinger, he has. Um, made a career out of bringing industrial films, educational film, government propaganda films, and making all of this stuff uh, available to people. And now he's moved to, to home movies and going and using these home movies to see our landscape as it evolves. So he's done the whole series of sort of how does San Francisco or Oakland or Detroit, how has it evolved by seeing old home movies, oh, which don't, don't have the same kind of narrative mm. um, that... Uh, Somebody is maybe trying to put on Detroit now. Right. You know, it's a much more nuanced history of exactly what was a big city like that like, and this is sort of the raw materials for the gen for the visual generation. You, somebody in the chat room mentioned, and you have the Prelinger uh, archives. Yes, Rick what? Prelinger is a hero of mine. This guy it's just kind of took a lot of video over twenty years, right? 
It wasn't, he, he didn't take the video. He collected, he collected I should them. say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He collected them before they were being thrown out. And, um, and he made his, he, he doesn't own his house for cash, so he actually has to make money. And he would sell it through stock footage. And when we were introduced uh, now 12, 13 years ago, I said, great, why don't we digitize it and put it up on the internet for free? And he said, <laughs> Wow, that sounds like a great idea. I've always wanted to do that, but uh, how, is, how am I going to make any money? And to his credit, he took the leap. He took the leap. He went and said, okay, I'll, I'll take the 2,000 of my most popular money-earning things, digitize them, and we'll put them up on the internet for free. And it made lots of very, people very happy. And to his surprise, actually, his business did better that people actually found the films that they wanted, but they wanted better services. And they went and would go and get that clip of a Corvair, no, unsafe at any speed, um, <laughs> from, the, uh, from Getty Images. And so that he'd still get money for those that wanted a, uh, a signature saying it was okay. But a lot of artists and, you know, just anybody's um, that, that now had computers that could do a little bit of editing they couldn't afford to go to Getty to go and get this stuff for student projects, for documentaries from the you know, low end. So they would just go and, and grab these materials um, and, and reuse them. And so this two-tier model where it's still bulk accessible, but there's still a premium services that are available to those that can pay for the services is working. Um, it, it's something you have to do carefully but you can have bulk access to all the materials and still make money on, on added, added value services. So this is how we'd like to see, for instance, digitizing all of the laws, all of the court cases, which right now is really quite expensive to use. Only lawyers can really afford to get to this stuff. Um, so that doesn't make any sense. These are all of our laws. And so why don't we go and make these things available in bulk um, and then... Um, have value-added services for those that want to. Uh, oh yes, weren't, weren't the '60s a wacky time? You could just spend days going through the Prelinger archives. I oh, got to tell you, do. people do, <laughs> uh, and they leave comments. There's some people that have even made it their hobby to go and watch and post a review to every one <laughs> of these. Um, but the home movies are even wackier. Oh um, yeah. Yes, you get a lot of birthday parties and trips to the zoo, um, but. There's also just you know people driving around and just what was their what was their house like um, you know people that aren't Hollywood beautiful um, it, they're just just us anyway it's sort of the World Wide Web from then I so just, is, is there a, there's a way that we can go and bring a broader deeper idea of what the world is like so that people can go and draw their own conclusions. Have it in bulk without sort of having an, a narrative. There's no little splitch on the bottom that goes and tags it by us. It's downloadable and in, in beautiful, uh, editable form. So you can go and reuse it in your videos or you can just click on it like this. Um, people are uploading things all of the time. Um, I, I find it actually quite encouraging. What we've seen out of the World Wide Web is people aren't just motivated by money. People want to make a difference. They want to do things that other people are going to appreciate. And that, that's encouraging. And also people are pretty particular and pretty peculiar. That people um, really want to know what they want to know. And it's not the same thing as everybody else. It, we're not just a bunch of Homer Simpsons waiting for the next TV series to, to start up. It, we're uh, a species that's really curious and peculiar. We get about 3 million users a day. We're about the 250th most popular website. According 3 million to Alexa users Internet. a day. That is such great that's news. A lot. That's amazing. It, and it's all old stuff. And so there is an interest in the old stuff. Oh yeah, um, and it, things that you can reuse, and uh, it, it's it's participating in a worldview that a lot of people seem to like. It's changing the world. It's so exciting. It really, uh, it really is cool. We're talking to Brewster Kale. Uh, I want to talk. I mean, you studied with Marvin Minsky at MIT, uh, Thinking Machines, which is legendary. I want to talk a little bit about that. Founder of Waze, and then uh, later Alexa which sounds like the beginning of Alexandria. I'm, I'm, I'm you got thinking it. maybe this is something, a, a theme. Yeah, 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 it's a theme. It's a theme in your life. We'll talk a little more in just a bit. Actually, couldn't be a better sponsor for the show. Our broadcast today brought to you by audible.com, which is in its own way a bookstore 
of audio books, 100,000 books uh, online, uh, amazing collection. Uh, I'm an Audible member, and, and I have been since the year 2000. And, you know, you find you don't have enough time to read, but there's always time when you're, if you've got to commute in the car or at the gym on the Stairmaster, how boring is that? Walking the dog, doing the dishes. I'm listening to audiobooks all the time, and it's a great way for me to kind of build up my knowledge uh, and, and get reading done at times when I wouldn't normally be able to read. That's why I have a library of over 500 books at audible.com, and I invite you to get your first book free at audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. I like to recommend books. I'm a big fan of a writer named Mary Roach. She's got a new one that just came out. You might remember her books, uh, Stiff, all about the uh, curious life of human cadavers, Bonk, the curious coupling of science and sex. Read both of those. The new one is called Gulp, Adventures on the Alimentary Canal. She's a science writer who does a great job of picking interesting topics and going deep in the name of science. So um, gulp is the digestive system, a journey that begins at the top and ends at the bottom of the alimentary canal. Wouldn't you like to read that for free? Well, it's just, or maybe not. Maybe you'd prefer uh, a little Alex Cross adventure or a thriller or some science fiction. They've got it all at audible.com. Go to audiblepodcast.com. Hard thing's going to be to pick that first book. Audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. Pick a book. That first month is free. The first book is free. You can cancel in the first 30 days, pay nothing, but the book is yours to keep forever. I think you're going to want to stick around, though. It's, uh, it is uh, such a great part of my life, and we're big fans. Audiblepodcast.com slash triangulation. Put the Audible app on your iPhone, your Android device, Metro. Uh, they have a Windows 8 version, Windows phone version. You're going to love it. I see there's a new uh, version of The Great Gatsby, Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh, reading that, I guess we're getting ready. There's a new, uh, a new Great Gatsby movie coming out, which looks like it has nothing to do with the book. Uh, it looks like a complete reimagining, as Hollywood might uh, might put it. But if you've not read the original, this would be a great time to to get that. Uh, absolutely free. Audiblepodcast.com/slash triangulation. By the way, I just want to mention, uh, you know, speaking of archives and classics, uh, Neil Gaiman. Uh, has been putting together a great series of undiscovered, unknown, classic uh, fantasy and science fiction books on audible.com. His newest is called Dimension of Miracles, written in the 60s by Robert Sheckley. It's kind of a, um, it's very much like Hitchhiker's Guide. It's about a, uh, thanks to a computer error, New Yorker Tom Carmody wins the main prize of the intergalactic sweepstakes. He claims his prize before the error is discovered and is allowed to keep it, but since he's a human from Earth and has no galactic status and no space travel experience, he keeps coming back to Earth. <laughs> and they can't get him home, and he's been going back and forth to different phases and realities of the planet. It is a comic novel of, of great dimension, written by, I'm sorry, read by John Hodgman, which makes it even better, and he's on the cover in a mustache and a spacesuit. So here's the deal. <laughs> This could very well be your Audible book. I, this is a great, but very funny book. But even if it's not, even if you're not an Audible member, we would love to get you in the drawing. You only have a couple of days left to enter. The Trip for Two to New York Comic Con 2013. Audible is giving away a trip for two, including round-trip airfare, four-night stay at a hotel, and two four-day passes to New York Comic Con coming up in October 2013. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash sweeps. And enter your email address, and you're entered to win. You don't have to be an Audible member. No purchase necessary. There's more information about the rules. You do have to be a legal U.S. resident to win. Audible.com slash sweeps. And uh, if that would be a Dimension of Miracles would be a great choice if you're looking for a book to read. Brewster Kale is with us, the uh, founder and uh, man behind the Internet Archive. Uh, nothing less than an attempt to archive all human knowledge and put it online so that you can access it and your kids can access it and amazing things can come of it. Um, was this your, you know, your, your computer science background, was this your goal? You went to MIT and you started, uh, you got into yeah. artificial intelligence. Is this something you've wanted to do your whole life? Yes. Um, I, I've always been sort of an optimist or a utopian and uh, a friend posed a question what's a positive future with your technology? Uh, it's easy to think about the negative. Yeah. It's really easy to complain, um, but it, it, it was really quite hard. And I could only come up with two answers. One was to try to protect people's privacy, and the other 
which was to go and build the library. I thought that building the library would be too obvious, so somebody else would do it. So I tried to do the, the privacy thing, but by learning how to develop chips, it was just turned out to be too expensive to try to protect um, voice communication. It wouldn't have helped the common man. It would have helped <laughs> all sorts of people that don't need my help, the military, mafia, corporations, whatever. So I, I went back to going and doing the, um, the library. That was in 1980, and really, I haven't had a new idea since. I just thought that, you know... <laughs> when you have a good idea, it's worth sticking with it. Yeah, yeah, and it's been a great path. I, it's, it, I thought I would be done with it by now, um, but it's taken a lot longer than I thought. Um, and it's because these institutional players are just very slow to change. We got a lot of publishers online pretty quickly, so I... I developed some of the supercomputers and chips and stuff and made it so that it could be a search engine and that was good but then that didn't change the world enough because it was expensive to use so wanted to make it so that it could be a search engine on this new thing called the internet that was coming around in the 80s so I developed and I, I claimed a fame I guess I think for being the internet hall of fame is I did the first inter internet publishing system it came before Gopher and before the web. It was called Waze, and it was a mechanism for going and searching remote systems. It was, it was uh, the web is much better and much easier to use, uh, but it was the first of that of that ilk. Um, and then the the idea was to try to get publishers online and in the open way. So the newspapers came along, worked with the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and. Oh, gosh, Scholastic magazines. Um, anyway, a bunch of uh, com computer magazines to go and get them online. We did the first advertising-based system with the library, with uh, Wall Street Journal, the first subscription service, to try to help them get online. And when that was going in 1994, 1995, I thought, okay, that's, that, that's moving. We sold that company to America Online. And then said, now it's time to build the library. And so started the Internet Archive and Alexa Internet at the same time. Alexa Internet, for profit, that ended up being bought by Amazon.com, um, donates a copy of everything that it gathers to the Internet Archive. Oh, that's great. And to Jeff Bezos' credit, when he said, well, why don't we buy you? I said, well, you know, I tried that with America Online. It's sort of complicated. Anyway, so he said, well, we can, we can make that work. We can make that work. And, uh, but I said, then there's this extra thing that you should know. There's a contract that Alexa Internet has to go and donate everything it does to a nonprofit. And he said, hmm, with a six-month time delay? I said, mm, okay. I, you know, I, I, I think we could live with that. That's a real credit to Jeff Bezos. That, that's not an obvious thing for yeah. just a you know, corporate titan to, to do. Um, and so Alexa Internet has been donating uh, what it collects of the World Wide Web every day ever since. And it's been... Well, I don't know. It's coming on 20 years now, so it's um, it, it's it's all around working. So Alexa Internet and the Internet Archive started at the same time, and then in 2002, after I sort of got it through that first storm, I left Alexa and then um, moved to the Internet Archive to just straight on just build the library. And how how hard could it be? And uh, so it's it's been great because as a tech techie, as a geek. Um, Dealing with these people that are cultural custodians of material is pretty interesting. I was back at Harvard yes, uh, last week, and they had their guys, you know, pulling out these these ancient uh, texts and these old keys, medieval things, and it's pretty interesting. For most most technology seems pretty sterile. Um, but dealing with these cultural materials and these people that deeply care and know and love these materials, they just don't know the new. They don't know the new technologies for disseminating them. That we geeks can be useful uh, in a very highly leveraged way. So these very sophisticated, well-funded fields like libraries and the like, um, museums, archives, um, need our help. And it's been a it's been a great path. Um, it's it's been a very interesting career. I learned from Marvin Ninsky the uh, uh, sort of pick a big subject, yeah, a big hard problem. He you know he called his sub his subject artificial intelligence, right? And that's not something you're ever going to finish in your lifetime. <laughs> uh, so, but it allows lots of people to cooperate with all have without having to work together. And it's not like going oh I want to make a million dollars, right? It's like well great, 
what happens when you get yeah, there? So what? You know, yeah. you move to Florida right. and sort of, you know, rot, you know. Um, and so, no, it's, it's uh, the idea is to uh, um, have something big, bold, something that other people will want to help you on and other people can help. And so this idea of universal access to all knowledge has really been uh, a good guiding motto for me. Um, and, you know, cribbed it from Raj Reddy from Carnegie Mellon, and it's, it's worked for me ever since. It is. It's a great idea. It's a wonderful, huge, undoable thing. And, and like water, you've just slowly chipped away at it, micron yes. by micron. And, and look at the progress you've made. It's really quite amazing. Books, music, video, web pages. We should do all lectures, though. Uh, and I, I'm encouraged by the open courseware and some of the edX things that are going mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. uh, some of the MOOCs. Um, we have a lot more we can share. We saw uh, some of that early things in the early podcast days, the IT conversations. Yeah. There's, there's a whole set of, of ideas that you don't have to be a, a publisher with Random House to have something to say that other people will want to hear. I think that's one of the reasons why the Internet's so satisfying is you can go and do something and then, hey, some other people go and say, hey, that's pretty cool. And, you know, I guess everybody that's under 30, 30 think that that's just the way it's always been and oh no it just no 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 <laughs> oh, it was no. very hard to get yourself involved in some way that you know you were just talking to more than just the people that were standing right next to you that this idea of everyone being a publisher i think that was sort of one of my first real chance to go and get that done so that we could uh build publishing new types of publishing and then we could build the library of well us and as a global brain that's integrated with the machinery and the networks that have been coming out in the last couple decades. I'm quite encouraged. It's, it's, a, it's been great fun and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. Completely interesting, weird things just keep popping yeah. up. I love BitTorrent. Uh, what a great technology, interesting stuff. Uh, Bitcoin, fantastic and, and, and bizarre and interesting. Uh, and I love that you can go and be you know, kind of anybody and go and if it's your idea is good enough, it just spreads without having to have the powers that be okay it. Isn't that marvelous? Just remarkable. So how can people help? I think there are probably uh, a lot of people watching right now who say, I like that, universal access to all knowledge. How can I help? Um, there are a bunch of ways. Uh, and the Internet Archive is, uh, can use help of people's time, either by building collections or adding things to the Internet Archive. Um, there's people, uh, donations of money help a great deal. Uh, we're always running you know, on fumes, if you will. We don't pay ourselves a lot. Um, so that, that can be uh, very helpful. People donate physical books. We're archiving physical books now as well. Um, people Where are you are putting uploading. those? Uh, oh, this is a fun one. Um, so we, we started uh, archiving and digitizing books, and we'd give them back to the libraries. But then we found that the libraries are starting to throw the books out. <laughs> they don't really want them. <laughs> they didn't want them back. They wanted the digital versions, and, and uh, so they wanted to make sure somebody had them, but they didn't really want to use the space if they didn't have to. It, you know, they'll, they'll keep some of them, but not, not all of them. So we started to, um, to actually collect them. And also for the in-copyright books. We, we had a hard time getting those from libraries, so we got those from the used book trade. Um, when they were unsellable, um, we were interested in one of everything, so they uh, went and gave us things, and also people donated huge collections to us. So we had to figure out, how are we going to keep these? And uh, so we uh, figured out a technology for putting them in boxes and having each one catalog, so we knew where they were to make a preservation copy. So the physical copy is kind of like a the Noah's Ark of books. It's, it's really meant to be long-term right. seat bank of books. And the access version is online. So the access version knows where the physical one is, and the physical version Perfect. one is ties to the, the access version. Then they, we made these shipping containers and converted them to, to be temperature <laughs> and humidity uh, stabilized at least, and we're looking to make them temperature and humidity controlled for these different environments and then we stack them up so in richmond california we've got about 600 and 700 thousand books that are cataloged and put away we want to get to 10 million um so people are starting to send us books as they downsize their libraries their personal libraries or their parents uh, houses um and we're since we only have 
a small fraction of, of all books. We probably have enough copies of the Da Vinci Code. Thank you very much. We're, we're done on that one. <laughs> we don't um, need but those. <laughs> the, uh, but there are lots and lots of other really cool books. So we're collecting physical books. So we want physical books. We want digital things. Um, time, money, um, help steer around the organizations they're working in now to go and make things more openly available. That's Try good. to find uh, those new business models that work without going and closing down access to people that can't necessarily afford yes. or you don't have a customer relationship. How can you change your model to offer things up? Be a um, subversive in your organization. Be a subversive. Uh, just be a little radical, open access uh, oriented. <laughs> Love it. Um, visit us when we're uh, in San Francisco. We have scanning centers in 30 locations, so it's in lots and lots of cities. So we're taking volunteers uh, working in scanning centers. We're also, uh, oh, we're starting to do VHS tapes. Oh, wow. Pretty fun. That, that's, yeah. a, that's a wacky. Uh, so the things that lived and died on tape, tape heads. Um, and so anyway, uh, there's, there's volunteers that are doing film prep. There's volunteers doing VHS digitization. Um, it's, it's all around great fun. You've also got this bit savers uh, group going, which will be near and dear to the hearts <laughs> of our, uh, our fans. Cause they're all, uh, they're all geeks. You're, you're keeping tens of thousands of documents and software products from the fifties into the two thousands manuals. Um, yes. The original manual for the Apple One. Here's one for me: the Atari 400-800 technical reference notes. Um, yep. it's all scanned in, all available online. Oh, th these these guys are the best. So this is this is a club, um, or sort of a community called Bit Savers, and they've been um, not only collecting the manuals, but also the software they ran on the Commodore Love and it. the uh, and the Apple II and all this. All you know, it had logo from uh, from when I just was graduating uh, from from MIT, and there it was. And so these guys are obsessive. They're completely great, and they have a, a website and a and repository. And they were uh, up for archive team, which is this rogue bunch of, of, of volunteers that are completely fun and great and they made a, a replica on the internet archive and the idea is to be respectful of the people that really did the work I mean it wasn't us we we're just spinning discs um, it was these bit saver guys and their huge community of people that are just loving this stuff and it's it's the little bit of librarian that's in all of us is there a way to make it so that we can sort of take our expertise and make it so that it lasts another generation. And so working with BitSaver or the, uh, the guys that are doing the recordings of concerts, go out and record a concert and, uh, and then upload it to the Internet Archive. Um, join the group of people that are doing it, and you'll learn more about microphone types than you may ever want to know. <laughs> um, and it, but there are these communities out there that maybe just need a digital bookshelf um, to be able to, uh, to, to make a, a, a permanent contribution to the world where when I was growing up unless you can get a book deal which was pretty darn hard to do um, you know maybe your kids knew what you were up to but that was kind of it um, and maybe they carried for your legacy the Internet Archive can carry forward uh, legacies of communities from all over the world and you can hear Jerry and Bob live from uh, Denver Coliseum 1973 too which oh, that's, that's a good show. <laughs> I love it. Brewster, oh, what a pleasure talking to you. I, uh, you know, I think about you, people like you, Danny Hillis, um, yes. Stuart Brand, people who are thinking about, thinking bigger than, hey, what's my next startup? How do I get funding? How do I make a billion dollars? You're thinking about changing the world. And it's so great that the Internet Archive has done such a great job and is, is really, truly a, a, a success that people point, can point to and say, see, this is, this is working. It's working. It's working. It's working. I really like the nonprofits, too. Yeah. We're having these high-tech nonprofits that are doing yeah. well. Wikipedia is, of course, yeah. you know, it's kind of, they're, they're excellent. Uh, but EFF, yep. Public Library of Science, the Linux Foundation, yep. really started by Richard Stallman with the, uh, with the Free Software Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and these organizations, there's the ISC uh, run by Paul Vixey, one of these, yep. the guy that wrote DNS. Um, it's a nonprofit ISP that these nonprofits are doing things at scale 
that are very interesting. I, I'm enjoying being in the nonprofits. It's a lot easier to, to share. It's a lot easier. Yes. To, we don't do non-disclosure agreements. We, we don't have a lawyer on staff. Sorry, we just don't. Uh, we don't want one. Um, it, that these um, are working together to build uh, a sharing economy where people prosper, but maximize sharing. Love it. Such a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today, Brewster. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Oh, just fantastic. I look archive forward to your other shows going up to the archive. We are going to upload this show, of course, so that's on archive.org, and I think we're just going to make it a process to, if you want them, you can have them. We'll get them of all course. up there. <laughs> thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you, Brewster. Brewster Kale, archive.org. We do triangulation every Wednesday, uh, and I think it's, uh, as you can see, well worth tuning in. If you can watch live, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 2300 UTC. But if you can't watch live, don't worry about it. We'll make on-demand versions available in audio and video at twit.tv slash TRI. And I think we should put them on archive.org as well so that they get preserved for uh, posterity. Uh, you can also subscribe. That'd be the best thing to do at iTunes or the Xbox uh, Music Place or whatever it is that uh, they call it these days. And you can get those shows every time there's a new one available. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Triangulation.